like I mentioned, just a couple more seconds, then I'll turn it over to Kathy. But thank you all for joining, and many of you joined nice and early, so I appreciate it. Hopefully, you didn't have struggles getting in the room or on the phone, so thank you so much. Okay, we're ready to go. Ready if you are, Kathy, feel free. Okay, thank okay. you. Oh, welcome, everyone. This is Kathy Nickham. I'm the um, Education Director for the DPC Ed Center. And I'd like to welcome you to our month of May patient webinar on kidney disease and depression. This is a really important topic, and it touches the lives of many kidney patients and their families. So we are happy that you're here with us today. And we are very pleased to be partnering this program with the American Psychological Association. We value their expertise on this subject very much. We also thank APA for their continued support. This is the third webinar that APA has produced for our members, and you will be able to look at the other ones um, that are already recorded at some point if you like. And they provide articles for our Kidney Citizens newsletter from psychologists who are uh, writing to help patients live well with dialysis. They also develop fact sheets for us, um, and they been distributed to dialysis facilities around the country. So we're very grateful for their continued collaboration and we look forward to the, uh, today's presentation. So at this point, I would like to turn the program over to Jewel with APA, who will then introduce our speaker. Jewel. Hi, yes, thank you so much, Kathy. And my name is Jewel Edwards-Ashman. I'm with the American Psychological Association and I really enjoy working with dialysis patient citizens to put together this webinar on kidney disease and depression and continue to educate people on the connection between psychological health and physical health. Selfishly, as a transplant recipient and kidney disease patient, I can't wait to hear from today's presenter and learn some new strategies on how I can also cope with living with a chronic illness. So I hope everyone's excited. Without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Maureen O'Reilly Landry. Dr. O'Reilly Landry is a licensed practicing psychologist and a member of the clinical faculty of Columbia University Medical Center. She is the leader the has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in services. five minutes. What? Sorry. She is the former director of psychological services for Apollo Healthcare, a dialysis company dedicated to the psychological well-being of patients and their families. And Dr. O'Reilly Landry has worked individually with many dialysis patients, both in-center and as part of a home hemodialysis program, and has run support groups for dialysis patients. She also maintains a private practice in New York City. So let's welcome Dr. O'Reilly Landry. Okay, I'd just like to say I just got a message that said I'm going to be disconnected in five minutes. Um, I don't know why that happened, <laughs> but um, are you able to hear me? Yes, and I got the same message, though. Okay. So. <laughs> oh, okay, so I can just talk through and it'll be fine? An anonymous participant has joined the conference. Hopefully, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so... Um, well, thank you for inviting me to address this really important topic of depression in dialysis and kidney disease and coping with a chronic illness. Um, it's really both an honor and a privilege for me to be here and to have been invited by the dialysis patient citizens and the American Psychological Association. So let me begin by saying that life with a chronic illness, such as end-stage renal disease, can be a pretty bumpy road with a lot of hurdles to navigate along the way. So not surprisingly, emotional ups and downs due to stress are very common among people undergoing dialysis treatment. So if you're currently receiving dialysis treatment or are part of a family where someone is on dialysis or have um, chronic illness, you may be experiencing a fair amount of stress. And this stress may be expressing itself in various ways. You may find yourself encountering feelings of depression, anxiety, fear, anger and frustration, despair and hopelessness, as well as other uncomfortable or unpleasant feelings and emotional experiences. And if you have had any of these feelings in the past, or if you're having them now, 
it doesn't mean that there's something fundamentally wrong with you. No, instead, what's happening is that you're really having normal responses to extraordinary circumstances, and you're not alone in this. Many other people on dialysis or who have chronic illnesses feel the same way. Yet despite being surrounded by other people, such as all the other patients and the medical staff on the dialysis unit, or other people in your life, a sense of isolation may arise. And similar experiences may be happening for family members and even friends as well, since a chronic illness can have a stressful impact on all the people who are involved. But just because your experiences are common for someone in your situation, that doesn't mean they should be ignored and not taken seriously. They're actually very important and require attention, but because they affect not only your quality of life and your happiness and sense of well-being, but also your physical health as well. And it's important for you to know that you don't have to feel this bad, and there are things that can be done to be feeling better. So at this point, you may be wondering, how do I know anything at all about how you might be be feeling undergoing dialysis treatments when I haven't experienced that personally myself. And if you were to say that, you would have an excellent point. So what I'm going to try to do today is to convey to you what I've learned from working as a psychologist on an in-center dialysis unit, as well as on the team of a home hemodialysis program. As a psychologist, it's been my privilege to talk to or more importantly, to listen to and learn from the people on dialysis who have chosen to confide in me about what was really going on with them inside. And the main thing I learned is that dialysis patients are fundamentally no different from me or from the doctors, nurses, or technicians who are treating them. The biggest difference is that dialysis patients have had to deal with the profound stress of having experienced organ failure and their family members suffering along right with them. Slide three. You still able to hear me? Yep, we're good. Yes, okay. I am. Okay. Uh, there's a well-known psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, Harry Sack Sullivan, who stated with regard to the doctor-patient relationship, he said, we are all much more simply human than otherwise be we happy and successful, contented and detached, miserable and mentally disordered, or whatever. So whatever your reaction or feelings, you're just being human. One of the very difficult things about the process of dialysis is that it can be experienced as kind of dehumanizing at times for the person who is getting the treatment. So many of the aspects of dialysis, whether it's being attached to a machine for hours at a time, watching your blood coursing through a tube, being described in terms of your medical lab values and your dry weight, and especially experiencing the disruption of the life that previously made you who you were, can all lead to a tendency to forget who you are and to lose touch with what made you the unique human being that you were and that you still are. The main goal of my talk today is to give you some ways to hold on to your uniqueness your specialness as a human being, and your sense of who you are as a person, even while you are experiencing dialysis. Slide four. Several years ago, I edited a book called A Psychodynamic Understanding of Modern Medicine, Placing the Person at the Center of Care. This is a collection of chapters written by psychologists and psychiatrists who work with medical patients in various settings. The purpose of the book was to let people know about what goes on psychologically for medical patients and healthcare clinicians beneath the surface or unconsciously. One of the chapters I wrote myself was based on my work with people receiving dialysis treatments and those who eventually received transplants. The chapter is called Man and Machine, the Relational Aspects of Organ Replacement. It describes something that I discovered by observing to people on dialysis, which is that people in various ways form emotional relationships not only with the medical 
care of them, but also with the dialysis machines that are taking care of them. Often, they do this in kind of playful ways, such as naming their machines or attributing personalities to them. One of the examples in the book was a man who called his home dialysis machine Lucy after the actress Lucille Ball's character in that old I Love Lucy TV show from many years ago. The reason that he did that was that Lucy in the show was always getting into trouble and creating trouble for her husband, Ricky. Ricky became famous, for, for those of you who are old enough to have um, become familiar with that TV show, uh, Ricky became famous for saying to his wife in this heavily accented um, Cuban accent, Lucy, you've got a lot of explaining to do. And that was how this man felt about his dialysis machine. Although he appreciated its value and the fact that it kept him alive and improved his health, he also felt it caused a lot of trouble in his life. So to turn his dialysis machine into a person in his mind was a playful and very psychologically healthy way this man had of trying to cope with all the complicated but very normal feelings he was having about being on dialysis. It also helped to humanize a process that may sometimes feel dehumanizing. The way that this man coped may or may not work for you, however. You are your own unique person, and it's important to get to know yourself and to figure out what works for you. Although it may not seem like there's much at all that's positive about the experience of having a chronic illness, I would like to show you some possibilities for how you might learn to regard it as an opportunity to learn about yourself and to get to know yourself better and to learn ways of dealing with your dialysis experience that might work for you. First, though, I'm going to talk specifically about depression, about what it is, what it feels like, before we get to what to do about it. Slide five. Here are the signs and symptoms of depression according to the National Institute of Mental Health. The NIMH does say, however, that people vary so that not everyone who is depressed experiences all the symptoms. Some people experience only a few symptoms, whereas others have many. How severe or frequent the symptoms are and how long they last also varies from one individual to the next. And the symptoms can also vary over time. So here's a list of symptoms that are most commonly seen in people who are depressed. First, persistent, sad, anxious, or empty mood. Feelings of hopelessness or pessimism. Irritability. Feelings of guilt, worthlessness, or helplessness. Loss of interest or pleasure in hobbies and activities. Decreased energy or fatigue. Moving or talking more slowly. Or feeling restless or having trouble sitting still. Difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions. Difficulty sleeping, early morning wakening, or oversleeping. Appetite and or weight changes. Thoughts of death or suicide or suicide attempts. Aches or pains, headaches, cramps, or digestive problems without a clear physical cause and or that do not ease even with treatment. Slide six. In addition, the person's experience of depression may vary according to whether or not you're male or female. Although it's not always the case, in general, women are more likely to report feelings of sadness, worthlessness, or guilt. Men, on the other hand, may be equally depressed, but that depression may look and feel quite different. Men are more likely to be tired, irritable, lose interest in one's pleasurable activities, and have difficulty sleeping. They also, men in general, tend to be more action-oriented, and so may turn to alcohol or drugs when they're depressed, often in an effort to self-medicate and ease the feelings of depression to try to feel better. Men may become frustrated, encouraged, irritable, and angry, and so more at risk to engage in abusive behavior. Some men may throw themselves into their work, avoiding talking about their depression, or behave recklessly. So if you do find yourself experiencing depression, 
especially if you're having thoughts about hurting yourself or someone else. Don't despair because there is help available. Just reach out to your medical team to ask for someone to talk to about how you are feeling. Slide seven. So what causes a person to become depressed? First, there's personal or family history of depression. It is true that some people are more likely to become depressed than others. Everyone has his or her own characteristic response to stressful or upsetting life events. If a person under stress has been depressed in the past, that may be their usual way of reacting to stress, so they will be more likely to respond that way again. Also, this tendency to respond in a depressive way tends to run in families. So if you have people in your family who have experienced depression, it's more likely that you will respond in that same way. Now, depression doesn't usually occur in a vacuum. There are some people who do become depressed without a stressor happening. But for many people, it takes some significant life change or psychological trauma to elicit a depressive reaction. Usually, that change involves some sort of a loss. It could be the loss of a person through death or breakup or some other separation. It could be the loss of a job or something else that is important or meaningful to the person. It might also be due to loss of self-esteem, such as might come from being bullied or abused or mistreated in some way. And it is definitely known that having a medical illness, particularly one that is serious or chronic, can lead to depression. In addition, some medications can have depression as a side effect as well. When medical illness is involved, the situation can become complex because the symptoms caused by that illness might make depression. And then it becomes a little difficult to tell whether or not the person is actually depressed or requires attention to their medical situation. Specifically, in the case of dialysis, being inadequately dialyzed can produce fatigue, poor appetite, and weight loss, which can look like depression. So this is another reason why it's important to be in good communication with your treatment team regarding all of your symptoms. Slide eight. And all the things that we're going to be talking about today and in your experience of yourself as a medical patient, it's important to remember that you are the expert on you and on your own experience. While there are many common reactions to the experience of dialysis, no two people have exactly the same experience because you are unique with your own personality and values. And these differences will influence the choices you make in what you do for both your medical and psychological treatment. When it comes to making choices, it's important to know yourself. The first step is to figure out what kinds of things you have choices about. At this point, you may be thinking, since when does a dialysis patient have choices? People are constantly telling me what I can and can't do, and I don't have any control over what happens to me. Slide nine. One aspect of choice is selecting which modality of dialysis is best for you. For example, hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis. And with improvements in technology, more and more people are becoming able to dialyze at home with some sort of form of home hemodialysis. So find out what modalities are available to you in your center or your geographical location and what might be the best match for your particular medical and personal living situation. This is an area in which it is particularly important to know yourself or to be able to figure yourself out because it turns out that dialysis patients are the same when it comes to how they do with the different modalities. Slide 10. A number of years ago, when I worked for Apollo Healthcare, a small dialysis company, I conducted a small study about patients' adjustment to home hemo versus in-center hemodialysis. In that study, I interviewed a small group of people who were thriving on home hemodialysis and then another group who were eligible for home hemo but preferred to stay in center. 
a striking difference between these two groups emerged. It seemed that the people who valued their autonomy and independence above all else were the ones thriving when they dialyzed at home. They greatly enjoyed being in a better position to make decisions that were based on their own needs and desires, since they felt less controlled by the restrictions of the dialysis center. However, those who preferred in-center dialysis were of a different type altogether. Those who opted for in-center hemodialysis preferred the safe feeling that they got from being in the presence of medical professionals while they were on the machine. Neither one of these groups is right or wrong. They're merely different types of people who value different things as being important to their lives. I do believe, however, that there's also really a third group of people, those who are somewhere in the middle. This third group of people would be those who also value their autonomy and independence, but who at the same time are fearful of medical procedures or have family members who are fearful of performing medical procedures. These are probably people who, with some extra attention, training, and practice, might actually be able to become more confident in their ability to handle medical situations. There's now a website you can go to called mydialysischoices.org, which is designed to help you to choose the best dialysis treatment modality for you, depending on your life circumstances and what you value as being most important to you in your life. All you have to do is fill out the questionnaire online about your current circumstances and what's important to you, and they will give you information about how compatible each dialysis modality is for you, given your values and your life. Slide 11. The most difficult thing in life is to know yourself. This idea may come as a bit of a surprise, since it may seem on the surface that we must know ourselves. But the reality is that we may certainly know some things, but much of our psychological life is unconscious and out of our awareness or beneath the surface, hidden even from ourselves. It's not uncommon to have all kinds of feelings about something, but not be in touch with them at all. We don't automatically know ourselves. And the second one, quote, is one that is particularly relevant to people dealing with illness. You never know yourself till you know more than your body. When we're sick, our body sends us messages calling us to pay attention to it. And that's a good thing because during those times, our body requires special care and it's good if we know a lot about how to take care of it. But at the same time, it can also lead to a situation in which we think only about our body and forget that we are so much more than that. If you're going to get to know yourself in a way that helps you to hold on to your specialness as a person, it might be helpful to think about yourself as consisting of different dimensions. Slide 12. This is called the biopsychosocial spiritual model. These four dimensions are intertwined and cannot be separated in any one individual. It's like the ingredients in a cake. You can't separate out the flour from the eggs from the sugar, but they all combine together to make the cake taste delicious. As a person with a chronic illness, you may find yourself of necessity having to spend a disproportionate amount of time thinking about the biological medical dimension of yourself, diet, fluid intake, weight, lab value, dialyzing time, etc. And this is vitally important. But it's not all of you, and so it's also important not to forget about the other dimensions. They're all important to your psychological well-being, as well as to your physical and mental health. In the remainder of the webinar, it will be very clear that the biopsychosocial spiritual model is at play, because many of these affect two or more of these dimensions at the same time. Slide 13. An example of how these dimensions are interconnected is the example of lapses in the ability to think clearly that some people on dialysis experience, problems of memory or attention and concentration. 
It's known that dialysis patients can experience such problems. What's not known, however, in any one individual instance is what the cause of it is. In some cases, this foggy brain, as some people call it, results because they are not adequately dialyzed or due to some other medical issue. However, other issues, such as inadequate sleep, depression, emotional stress or anxiety, can also produce the same problems with memory, attention, and concentration. If you're experiencing such problems, again, discuss it with your medical team to try to figure out what the cause is for you. Slide 14. Now, back to the bio, psycho, social, spiritual model. Even though all of these dimensions are intertwined and can't be separated out in reality, I'm going to need to talk about them as though they are separate so that we can understand each dimension better and talk about different ways to maximize your well-being in each of the areas. However, in all the possibilities that I will describe for how to relieve stress or depression or anxiety or increase your sense of well-being, keep in mind that each one of you is a special individual case, and so what I'm describing at any given time may or may not be right for you. One example of this is the case of medication for depression and anxiety. A doctor would need to make an evaluation to see if your particular symptoms are ones that might be helped by medication, and if so, which medication might be right for you. But the decision doesn't end there because even if medication would be appropriate for your symptoms, maybe it isn't the right choice for you as a person. Some people for whom an antidepressant has been recommended, for example, have told me, look, I'm already taking 20 pills a day and I refuse to take any more if I don't absolutely have to. So for that person, we need to find another way to help them with their depression. On the other hand, for another person, an antidepressant might be exactly the right thing, such as the man who told me with relief and surprise, he said, you mean all I have to do is take a few more pills each day and I'll feel a lot better? That's amazing. So for that person, the doctor believes it is right for this person to take an antidepressant, and it fits with the values of the person who will be taking it. So that's a good match for that particular person. But other things besides medication can help to reduce the stress, depression, and anxiety that can go hand in hand with being on dialysis or having a chronic illness or being a family member of some, someone with a chronic illness. And I'll be discussing these in the course of this webinar. A study was just recently published that I believe will turn out to be important to anyone with a chronic illness, even though it only included people with HIV. It's a study that demonstrates how our emotional and physical health are profoundly connected and influence one another. In this study, psychologists found that teaching people specific skills that could enhance and increase their positive emotions had the effect not only of improving their depression, but also of improving their medical condition. I really wish that there would be a study like that of people on chronic dialysis to see whether learning skills to increase positive emotions helps them to feel less overwhelmed with stress, depression, and anxiety, and also improves their physical health. But maybe those of you who are listening to this webinar don't have to wait for a study. Instead, what I'll do is describe a bit of what works for the people in that study who are living with HIV and you can explore and experiment and see if any of this works for you. Slide 15. Now remember, the ultimate goal is getting to know yourself and what works for you. One thing about depression is that it affects motivation and can get in the way of people taking care of themselves and even doing things that they enjoy doing. Depressed people often feel more helpless than they actually are. That's why it's important to be aware of what depression is and the ways it might be affecting you so that you can know how to get proper treatment for it. In terms of coping with stress and depression, it may be helpful to know that our thoughts, 
feelings, and behaviors are all interconnected and influence one another. So if you're having a lot of negative and pessimistic thoughts about yourself um, or a situation, that can lead to feelings of depression. And then these negative thoughts and depression may lead us not to take care of ourselves in the way that will make us be healthier and feel better in the end. And then the sicker we feel, the more pessimistic we become. And this sets up a negative cycle. The good news is that there are various things that can be done to break into that cycle to help people to feel less depressed, to think more positive thoughts, and to engage in activities that are good for them. So I'll describe some ways of enhancing positive emotions and reducing stress that have been found to work for many people. Slide 16. But first, let me take a moment to shed some light on why you might not be having very many positive thoughts at this point and why your thinking might be quite negative. As human beings, our nervous systems are designed to enable us to survive. What happens when a person is under a lot of stress is that the body and mind go into a state of high alert and become acutely aware of the dangers in the environment. This is a very good thing for coping with a crisis or threat. For example, when a person is first given a crisis of a serious illness, the mind and body at first perceive this as a threat, a danger that must be dealt with. So the person goes into survival mode, meaning they go into fight, flight, or freeze. Your body and mind prepare to either run away and hide from the danger, which can take the form of denial that one is sick. But even running away through denial can actually have a positive side to it, as long as it doesn't last too long, because it gives the person just a little more time to adjust and to process the information that they've been given at their own pace. Another way to respond to danger is to stay and be prepared to fight or to take positive action to confront and deal with the threat. Confronting the threat, if you know what to do, can feel empowering. But if you don't know what to do, or if you do know what to do but don't feel capable of doing it, that can lead to a sense of helplessness and powerlessness. And sometimes people freeze at that point. That's one of the reasons why the social dimension of this bio-psycho-social-spiritual model is so important. By forming a positive alliance with your medical treatment team, you can get the tools in the form of knowledge about how to keep yourself as healthy as possible. But whether you respond initially with fight, flight, or freeze, it's good to know that all of these reactions are perfectly normal ways of dealing with a highly stressful situation. But still, how does your response to danger and threat lead to negative thoughts? Well, negative, anxious thoughts accompanied by fear are part of survival when there's a looming danger. It's part of the fight response. Thinking about and anticipating what might go wrong enables us to meet a dangerous or challenging situation. It's only by being alert to danger, by thinking about what might go wrong, that we can be prepared to confront that danger. And that's very helpful in the first acute phase when there's an immediate crisis. But then, if you have experienced a series of crises, one after another, your mind and body may stay in crisis mode, always anticipating danger and expecting the worst. Your mind and body has become trained to see the negative because it wants to be prepared for any danger that might come. But when your mind is not able to stop being negative, the body is not able to sit and relax. The mind and body then become overworked, exhausted, and run down. Essentially, the mind has been trained to be negative, to be thinking about bad things. What often follows is a sense of helplessness and hopelessness. And when this happens, the mind and body need to be retrained to learn again how to relax and rest, or to relearn, or maybe even learn for the first time, what it is like to feel good and to have positive thoughts and positive emotions. 
And that's what the psychologists taught the people with HIV to do. They taught them how to retrain their minds and bodies, their entire nervous systems, to feel, function, to feel and function better. And that is what we will cover in this next section of the webinar, slide 17. In order to be able to effectively retrain your nervous system to respond in a different way, it's important to be consistent and regular in making those changes. It is better and more important to do something small and do it consistently than it is to do something big but inconsistently. The motto is small things often. One small thing that you might do is to consciously pay attention to the positive aspects of your life and to direct your mind to notice what is positive in it to notice what is positive in your feelings, in your thoughts, in your environment, in your family. To notice what there is to appreciate and feel gratitude for. This may be hard at first, and maybe you're so accustomed to being on high alert for the next bad thing to happen that you've lost touch with what's good or have given up hope that there is good. But that might just be you in crisis mode talking. So you might choose to try this out and see if it works for you. Some people find it useful to get a notebook or a journal dedicated to this purpose and write these things down formally every day. There are even journals and apps you can get that can help with this. A popular one is called the Five Minute Journal, which you can buy as a book journal to write in or as an app if you prefer to do it on your phone. This journal takes five minutes every morning and night, or you can create your own vision. There are many positive psychology um, and gratitude apps out there. Another one that gets good reviews is called Bliss, if you prefer a phone app over a book. Slide 18. In the study of people with HIV, the skills they were taught that increased positive emotions consisted of the following. One, recognize a positive event every day. Two, savor that positive event by logging it in a journal or telling someone about it. Three, start a daily gratitude journal listing things you might otherwise overlook but that can be appreciated. Four, List a personal strength each day and note how you use this strength recently. Five, set an attainable goal each day and note your progress. Six, report a minor stressor each day. List ways in which it can be positively looked at. This can lead to increased positive emotion in the face of stress. Seven, practice small acts of kindness each day. And eight, practice mindfulness with a daily 10-minute breathing exercise. Slide 19. Having a chronic illness can be a very lonely experience. You may be surrounded by people but still feel isolated and alone. Again, that's a normal feeling. But if you acknowledge and recognize it, you can also do something about it. Remember the slide that showed that thoughts, feelings, and behavior are interconnected and influence one another? Well, that's true in the social dimension as well. Very often when we feel alone, we keep to ourselves and withdraw from other people because we feel so bad, or we may become angry and lash out at the people around us. This withdrawal or expressions of anger have the effect of pushing other people away, often in ways that we really don't even want. And this leaves us feeling more alone and deprives us of the kind of social support that would actually be good for us. The solution to this is to make conscious efforts to reach out to the other people in our lives in positive ways. Make an assessment of your relationships and what might be done to improve them. And in the same way that talking to a psychologist can help to change our negative outlook to a healthier, more positive one, and can help us to cope with our feelings in a better way, a psychologist can also help us to improve our relationships. As I said at the beginning of this webinar, families and friends are also 
affected by the stresses of a chronic illness. It's very difficult to see someone you care about suffer, and that in itself can be a source of stress on a relationship. I've spoken to many people who've said that they feel they were abandoned when they became sick. In many instances, however, it turned out that it was not that the friend or relative no longer cared about them, but rather it was that the friend didn't know what to do or say or how to act, so they avoided the awkwardness of the situation. Or they may have thought that the person with the illness was angry with them or wanted to, or actually wanted to be alone, and so they stayed away, thinking that they weren't wanted. It's important for everyone to nurture their relationships. Psychologists can be useful in helping people to do that as well. Slide 20. One important way that the social dimension can affect your health is through the kinds of relationships you form with your medical team and other healthcare providers. You have many of them in your life now, doctors, nurses, technicians, dietitians, social workers, and others, and that may seem overwhelming at times. But they're also a great source for you, both for medical information and for social support. It can be helpful to try to maintain good relationships and open and clear communication with your healthcare providers. Playing an active role in your own medical care is important, and there are some guidelines for how to do this on this slide. First, prepare questions in advance and keep a notebook with questions you want addressed as well as the answers you get, and all relevant information. Taking a friend or relative to health appointments can be helpful because you're not, if you're not feeling well or are very anxious, you may not be in a focused frame of mind in which you're able to make the best use of the time. It may also help you to feel less alone. It's also okay to follow up with your providers after appointments if you're uncertain about something after the appointment is finished. The more positive your patients are around your medical treatment, the better you will feel about your health management. Slide 21. When I speak about the spiritual dimension, I'm not talking only about religion. Many people are not religious, of course. They may be atheists who don't believe in any religion at all, but still have a spiritual aspect to them in the way that I'm using the term. So I'm including, as part of the spiritual dimension, all concerns with leading a good and meaningful life. Very often, in the interest of science, the spiritual dimension gets left out or forgotten about or is believed not to matter. So that's why I was happy to see another recent study that showed that people who went on a one-week religious retreat not only came back feeling more spiritually and religiously enhanced, but at the same time showed changes in their brain chemistry, in their levels of serotonin and dopamine, which are the ones related to depression and sense of well-being. Although the study doesn't indicate specifically what caused the changes in these neurochemicals, it does suggest that biological and spiritual dimensions are, in fact, connected to each other. Now that we've covered the four dimensions, biological, psychological, social, and spiritual aspects of what makes you the unique human being you are, I'd like to leave you with some practical tips for how to implement some of these ideas in your daily life. Slide 22. Time spent in the dialysis chair is often regarded by dialysis patients as a necessary evil, necessary to maintain health, yet evil because it interferes with doing so many other things they might rather be doing. But it is also an opportunity to practice your positive thinking by regarding it as a structured opportunity to improve your life. If you are able to use the positive thinking we just spoke about, then reframe your time in the dialysis chair and think about it instead as an opportunity to practice your self-care. Many of the specific activities from that HIV study I described, for example, can be done in the dialysis chair. You can see what works for you. And remember, small things often. Meditation is a gentle but surprisingly powerful tool 
that has been shown to improve people's quality of life in a large number of ways. People who engage in a regular and consistent meditation practice report feeling less depression, less anxiety, more mental clarity and focus, as well as a reduction in the amount of distress they experience from the physical pain they might be having. There are various forms of meditation, and again, some forms appeal to some people more than others. This is another place for choices based on individual differences. The type that has been researched the most and is very popular is mindfulness meditation. But many people like transcendental meditation, compassion meditation, or else other more religiously based forms of meditation such as centering prayer or other types of prayer. When done on a daily basis for 20 minutes, people reap not only psychological benefits such as the ones I described, less depression, less anxiety and pain, but since it also has an overall calming effect on the nervous system and the body, there can be physical health benefits as well, such as lower blood pressure. While the benefits of meditation can be great, many people say, oh, I tried to meditate, but I can't do it. I can't clear my mind, and I keep getting distracted by all the thoughts I'm having. But being distracted by thoughts is completely normal. It's our natural state as human beings. One simple form of meditation and the basis of many forms involves just attending to something like the breath as it goes naturally in and out of the body. Focus your attention on the breath. It is inevitable that your mind will wander. When you realize that your mind has wandered, just gently notice that and then gently, without judging yourself, Bring your attention back to your breath and then continue doing that over and over again. Each time you notice that you're being distracted by some thought, emotions, or bodily sensations, just ever so gently bring your attention back to your breath. Every time you gently and without judging yourself bring your attention back to your breath, you are training your nervous system in the gentlest of ways to be more fully present in the moment and training yourself to practice guiding your attention and also to be less critical of yourself. Controlled breathing exercises have also had a very beneficial effect on the nervous system, on the mind, body, and spirit. Different types of breathing can have different effects. Practitioners of yoga and meditation have known this for ages and science is now studying breathing as well as meditation. For example, long, slow, deep breaths activate the parasympathetic nervous system and so have a very calming effect on the body. It's the opposite of the fight, flight, freeze response, and it's helpful for people who are depressed, anxious, or overstressed. This type of coherent breathing, for example, breathing in deeply and slowly to the count of five and then out to the count of five, when practiced for 20 minutes daily, also has a restorative effect on a highly stressed nervous system. Sometimes it is helpful to listen to a recording that helps to pace the breathing to the sound of chimes. There are many things that you can obtain online, um, and um, many of them are free. So this helps to keep the slowed pace of the body um, if you're having difficulty slowing down sufficiently. Again, consistency and practice is what serves to change the nervous system. There's a book written by two psychiatrists, Dr. Richard Brown and Dr. Patricia Gerbarg, called The Healing Power of the Breath. In their book, their recommendation is for people undergoing the stress of a medical illness to do a practice of 20 minutes of coherent breathing and other types of breathing two times each day in addition to on and off breath practice throughout the day. The three minute breathing space is a very brief guided mindfulness exercise that can be done at convenient times during a stressful day. 
It is not a substitute for the daily 20-minute practice of meditation or coherent breathing, but can help if you need a mood boost during the day. Another way to cope with and reduce the effects of stress is to laugh. When we find something funny and laugh about it, it changes our brain chemistry and releases endorphins, which are the brain chemicals that make us feel good. So watch TV shows and movies that are funny, spend time with people who are funny, or have good humor and make you laugh, read books that are amusing. Do whatever you can to laugh. It turns out that just laughing, even when nothing is funny, has the same effect on the brain and the body as laughter that is in response to something we find amusing. And that's why laughing yoga was invented. Laughing yoga classes involve people getting together to laugh together in different ways and doing different things. This is another way you can gradually change your nervous system and train it to experience positive emotions. Listening to music you find enjoyable can also be a wonderful mood-changing experience that can be done in your dialysis chair. And the time spent getting your dialysis treatment also provides an opportunity to write in your positive experiences or gratitude journal. And finally, you can read an enjoyable book. There are two activities that, are, that some people like to do in the dialysis chair that are a little more controversial. One is keeping up with the news, either by listening, watching on TV, or reading. While it's good to be informed about what's going on in the world, too much exposure to news media coverage of upsetting events can increase people's level of anxiety and distress because it's often presented in very sensationalistic form in which the same upsetting information is repeated over and over. So my suggestion would be to put limits on the time you spend with news media, particularly if you find yourself becoming anxious and worried about situations that you feel helpless to do anything about. The second controversial dialysis chair activity, and I hesitate to say this because I know it's popular, is that sleeping during your dialysis treatments. The reason that sleeping in your dialysis chair may not always be a good idea is that it can interfere with sleep at night, and then people sometimes find and people find they are up all night, and it can interfere with the sleep. And the sleep can be more fragmented and less refreshing, so people feel less energetic, less focused, and more depressed. So again, decide what's right for you. If taking a nap while dialyzing leads you to feel better and more refreshed, by all means do it. But if you do find that napping in your chair is causing problems with your sleep or you're not feeling better, try experimenting and see if engaging in some other activity during the dialysis time might work better for you. Slide 23. Aerobic physical activity is one of the best, most effective antidepressant and anti-anxiety treatments there is. Before starting on any kind of program of exercise, it's important to be medically informed by having a discussion with your treatment team about what kind of physical activity is safe and appropriate for you to engage in. Once you know that, pick a type of exercise that you will enjoy and will do. As with many things in life, and especially if you are already feeling depressed, getting started might be challenging. So again, start small, do it often, and gradually build up from there. It's a similar situation with yoga. Yoga is great for the mind, body, and spirit, but it has to be the type that is right for you in your specific situation. There are certain yoga poses specifically designed to alleviate anxiety and depression, and others that are either energizing or relaxing. Just make sure you know from your medical team what poses, if any, to avoid or to modify and be sure your yoga instructor knows your specific limitations so the appropriate modifications can be made. Slide 24. So to summarize, having a chronic illness can be very stressful, and this stress can take the form of feelings that may seem overwhelming, but do not have to be, such as depression, anxiety, fear, and anger. But remember that you're not alone in this. And there are many things that can be done to help with these experiences. 
Remember also that you are a unique and special human being. I hope this webinar has been helpful in letting you know what some of those things are that might work for you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that ex Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Uh, I think you've shared a lot of specific suggestions that, that we can all use, um, and I value everything you shared. It was a great presentation. Uh, Jewel, Christy, do you have anything that you would like to add? Yeah, sure. Hi, this is Jewel Edwards-Ashman with APA. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Riley Landry, for your presentation. Um, I learned a lot, and I hope everyone else who, whether you're on dialysis or have kidney disease and are waiting for a transplant, or even if you are just a family member or a friend, I, I really hope that this presentation was useful to you. So thank you very much um, for, uh, for sharing everything with us, Dr. O'Reilly Landry. Okay. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And we will have the recording available on our website if, for those who want to share it with others as well as go back and, and re-listen to it.